Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel, uh, and this is Indo-Pacific Compass, uh, featuring our new host, Christopher Cottrell. And I'm going to just introduce Ginger Cruz, and she's going to tell us about the um, storm in Guam. Welcome to the show, Chris and Ginger. Nice to have you here both. So, uh, Ginger, um, you're a consultant on compliance for the military and other federal agencies. Uh, tell us what you do so we can get a handle on your experience in Guam. So um, I actually grew up my whole life on Guam, uh, left in 2000, went to the States, uh, had a variety of, of positions working for the federal government, ended up being the Deputy Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction. Um, and so I have a lot of familiarity with, uh, you know, stabilization and reconstruction efforts. Uh, about 10 years ago, founded Manton International. It's a consulting firm, and we support defense contractors who work in various parts of the world, um, Iraq, Lebanon, the Philippines, Guam. Uh, and, and we help them with compliance, we help them with business intelligence, uh, vetting, on the ground work. We also do some policy work in Guam. Um, I once upon a time worked uh, both in the media and for the governor of Guam back in the day. Uh, so we do some policy work as well, assisting with uh, federal programs, military programs, um, and there's a lot going on in Guam right now. So Oh, and there was uh, a lot going on a few weeks ago with that storm. So you know, we, we talk about citizen journalism here, Chris. Um, yeah. And it's very rare that we have an actual journalist on the show. <laughs> and, and we'll all be very interested in the way you frame your interview questions to Ginger. Okay, we're going to learn from you, Chris. Go for it. <laughs> well, yeah, thanks, Jay. Welcome, Ginger. I think, you know, first and foremost, uh, Ginger Cruz is a journalist. And I met Ginger in um, August of 2021. Luckily, Guam had vaccines rollouts, and I was in East Asia, so that was one of the few places I would get them. But we had a discussion of the importance of Guam uh, to the United States, to the Indo-Pacific, to the um, the world, really. And I began to say, well, Ginger, what should we do about having greater voices for Guam? And when Typhoon Mawar hit, uh, I you know texted Ginger, I said, are you okay? And you know she had gone down to her basement. And we'd had discussions before when her... Um, uh, she has an apartment in Beirut, and the windows had blown out there. She'd been in Iraq. She's been in a high-intensity disaster zone. So I thought, well, uh, Ginger, one out of care, how are you doing, and how are the residents of Guam doing? So the residents of Guam really, I mean, once again, it's it's a very prepared, resilient place. This is not our first rodeo. Um, it's been 21 years since a major typhoon hit Guam, and Mawar hit us on the 24th of March, um, and the winds were potentially 140 gusting to 170. It could have been in excess of that, but once again, the radar up in the northern tip at Anderson Air Force Base broke at the height of the storm, as it always does. I always wondered about that. I mean, like, aren't they meant to measure typhoon strength winds, and shouldn't they make radar so that they could actually sustain the winds that they're supposed to measure? But... That aside, um, you know, no one, there, there were no casualties, nobody died uh, on the island, thank goodness, and, and that's because of the preparation, but the suffering has been intense. Um, it once again uh, destroyed a lot of the infrastructure that had to be quickly rebuilt. Uh, 20 years of advancements really made a difference for people on Guam. So the recovery is going faster, but of course it's not fast enough for the people who don't have water and power. Um, but there've been a lot of challenges. And, and the interesting thing this time is with the renewed um, focus of the military on expanding its presence in Guam and being the tip of the spear for indo pacom being the hub of the spokes. I mean, really this is where it's all at. The military was hit very hard. Uh, the two major bases, Anderson Air Force Base up in the north, um, they lost water. Uh, they had issues with the water wells, the generators flooded. I mean, no amount of preparation can really prepare you for what Mother Nature can do. And then down in the south, where or in the center of the island where the Navy base is, they lost power. Um, that, you know, significant amount of damage to the infrastructure. And the interesting lesson from that is that in the north, the Air Force Base and Camp Blas, which is going to be the first new Marine base that the Marines have had in decades, put the power underground. Cost billions of dollars, but clearly your military capability did not go offline because they had done that. Navy bases like a lot of Guam did not have, they'd strengthened the poles, they're concrete now, but 
the power still went down. So there's a lot of discussion right now surrounding the need to improve the climate resiliency of Guam, not as a tree hugging climate, you know, global warming issue, but is an actual issue of national security, because you cannot have the critical infrastructure for our, our main communications, space based marine, submarine and air force bases going down for days or, or, you know, even longer because of something like a typhoon, which we know will happen now that we've got an El Nino weather pattern. Okay, Ginger, so you, you, you raised um, climate resiliency, which has a, a variety of factors. I think there's adaptation, there's mitigation, there's resiliency. But in terms of resiliency, what was it like for the hospitals? Because you and I were texting about some of the hospital um, crisis that had um, firstly impacted the civilian population. The hospitals were in, in very critical uh, condition. At the height of the storm, uh, the, several of the windows had blown in the shutters. They're right on the cliff line, literally right next door to where, where I'm at. The shutters had blown off um, and the water was pouring in and they had to actually evacuate the pediatric ward, bring the kids into surgical rooms because they had no windows. They were terrified. Um, you know, there were points in time where the, the doors where the generator was were about to blow in. They got on the microphone, were yelling for people to go downstairs. Like 30 people went down and had to physically hold the door shut to prevent the doors from blowing in, which would have um, flooded the generators, which then would have knocked out the power, which, you know, for all the critical patients, that's, there's only two hospitals on Guam. Um, that's the main one. And, and so it, it was incredibly critical. There were, uh, there was so much flooding that there were shorts in some of the electrical panels and nurses who, you know, can do everything in the emergency room were turned into firefighters. They were grabbing, um, you know, fire extinguishers to put to put out the fires. There was a fire in the cafeteria. So, I mean, it was it was terrifying for the people that were there. Um, it was difficult. And the challenge is Guam, like, is at that point where we're supposed to replace the hospital. We're going through this whole process now where we need to get the funding to get a new hospital. There have been some political battles over where to put it. But I think, you know, having gone through this and, and the only other hospital, the private hospital, was also having issues with the generator and were worried that they would have to hand bag um, patients that were on oxygen or on some kind of, you know, support uh, if those generators went down. So it was really a critical situation. Um, can you also speak about the maternity wards? What happened to the maternity wards in the hospital? I, it was kind of the same the same issue. Th those were the areas that got hit uh, very hard by, by the storm. They had to, in some cases, move some of the patients in. Um, there was a lot of flooding. There was a lot of issues. So, I mean, it the whole hospital re really took a hit. And, and the hospital itself has been assessed by the Army Corps of Engineers. It only has four years left on its life. Uh, so the need to really you know, not only fix the plane while you're flying it, but it's an old plane that needs to be retired. So Guam really needs to get to get moving. Um, it, it's got, it wants to, governor's been trying to, to get this moving. There's been uh, some back and forth on it though. And, and politically um, it needs to be worked out, but we, we definitely need a new hospital. Okay. Um, regarding FEMA response, U.S. Coast Guard, U.S. military responses to the civilians, uh, what did that look like? It was amazing. Um, so the governor did a pre-emergency declaration once we knew that it was headed directly for us and FEMA actually pre-positioned some supplies and pre-positioned staff. So as the storm was hitting, we had over a hundred FEMA folks already on the ground, which is, which is amazing. Um, it was a little bit slow for people's, um, for people's pleasure. I think people were still very frustrated because they were hit pretty hard. Um, but Public Works did a great job clearing the roads. And as much as uh, the island is only 49% restored on power uh, in terms of customers, um, and about, I would say, 90% back in terms of water, um, we're in week three. So it, it's been, or we're getting into week three. So it, it's been tough for folks that don't have it, especially uh, there's been an increase in people who need dialysis, um, people who have insulin. So when they don't have electricity and there was a problem with, you know, lack of, of water and 
the capability to make ice to be able to do things like keep insulin cold. So um, there there was a lot of help. The the Salvation Army, the Red Cross, the governor's office, all you know, everybody was working around the clock, um, and we're small enough that people can go out to you know all the homes and all the relatives and try and help everybody and bring them in and and you know it's it's difficult it's challenging people are still hurting but at the same time uh, it's an island that also knows how to come together and how to help neighbors i there was a neighbor whose windows did blow out mine didn't um so i took her and her dog in for for a couple of days you know while while we could go ahead and fix her windows and get her back in in her space in terms of the environment, uh, there's a lot of damage to some of the, the forests and the reefs. Can you speak about that a bit? Yeah, so the reefs will recover, I believe. Um, they're still, they still need to assess how bad it was because it kicks up the stones uh, and causes some damage. But in terms of agriculture, uh, you know, there was about 90% to 100% of the crops on the island were damaged. But what was sadder than that is the trees. Uh, Guam has not a lot of really large, beautiful trees, uh, and we also struggle with the rhino beetle, with the coconut trees, and we're a tourism destination, just like Hawaii, and it's important that we, we're a beautiful island. I mean, the, the nature here is amazing, but the trees have a hard time. A lot of the trees that were decades old that had survived all the previous storms and in the last 20 years had grown even more and were just so beautiful have just, you know, been destroyed. Uh, a lot of them are just ripped up at the roots and they're so huge and they couldn't be saved. So people have all been just, you know, uh, taking out their their buzz saws and and clearing all of the debris. As a result, um, you know, it's it's really sad to see. And one of the the pushes I think that that the island is going to be making, especially since we're a tourism destination, is to really get some support from US Department of Agriculture or through tourism grants to try and get some of the greenery back because that's what makes an island beautiful. The ocean is always the ocean. It will heal itself. Um, it's used to these storms, but the land took a beating and uh, a lot of trees that I knew as a child that were big, beautiful trees. And there's so few of them on Guam because we've had so many storms over the years. Uh, and this one took out a lot of the ones that had remained. Yeah, Chris, let me jump in on one thing that, oh, um, that comes yes. out. Well, you mentioned that um, it took a while for energy to come back. What kind of resources do you have for energy? Do you, do you have uh, solar fields? Um, what are you using for energy? How are those things affected? Uh, what did you learn in the process on making it more, more resilient? The most interesting lesson, I think, was the battery power. So because we had started to go solar, um, our power system has a goal of 2045, uh, really converting to, to um, green energy. And we're really on the path. I think we're close to 20% in terms of our, our solar power generation. The larger solar panel farms, I think, survived, but a lot of the household solar panels uh, it took some damage. Um, I I've yet to get sort of a an accurate assessment of that, but just driving around the island, you can actually see solar panels that had ripped off roofs and are lying on the ground. So there is that issue. But the interesting thing is the solar power goes along with batteries these large batteries that store up. So when the, the generate, the big baseload generators generate a lot of power and the demand is low, they put them in these massive batteries. And then when, you know, the demand exceeds the, the supply, they can sort of even that out with batteries. So there's a, a concept right now that the military and the government of Guam are looking at, instead of using generators on the water wells or some of those other areas, they're looking at turning to batteries uh, and, and again, I'm not thinking the small ones, but the, but the bigger ones. And if the batteries can get better in terms of technology, um, it could be a way to strengthen and harden the system in the critical infrastructure areas, things like the hospital, things like the water wells. Um, because, the, you know, the water, aside from the turbidity issue, the main issue was getting all of the generators back up and running, uh, getting fuel to them and uh, drying them out because, you know, a lot, anything with an electrical panel, I don't care if it had a building around it, it, it's still, you know, that water just goes in and, and damaged a lot of them. And it took a lot to get everything back online. I'm asking because um, after, what was it, uh, Hurricane Maria uh, in Puerto Rico, um, their power system failed. And when they looked at it, they found there were two kinds of fasteners used in the solar fields, the solar farms. 
and one kind um, was sustainable and the other one was resilient and the other one wasn't. Um, so they decided we better, we better change this around because it took them a long time to get back online. I think the one thing that Guam does very well is our building codes here are probably one of the strongest in the world. Um, I've been through an 8.2 earthquake in Guam that lasted for 60 seconds. And I've been through, uh, I think about at least three or four major storms. My first one was Pamela, which was, you know, in excess of 180 miles an hour back in 1976. So everything here is built stronger. Um, and, and I believe when they put in those solar fields, when they, when they've switched out, almost all of the um, power poles are cement. We'd love to put them underground. Um, there's a movement that I've been trying to push for because, you know, if you look at the price of one aircraft carrier, it's $10 billion. If you look at putting all of Guam's power infrastructure underground, it's $6 billion. And if you're talking about a long-term investment that will pay off for the Navy, for the Air Force, for the people of Guam, for, for you know, everybody, um, doing that in the long term would mean a lot. But you're right, in terms of generation, um, I think the solar did all right. I, I honestly don't have specifics on that one but uh but it appears that you know the the loads are getting back to where they need to now the question is the hard slog we're only at 48 percent recovery uh, which is better than 20 years ago 20 years ago at this point in time we were only at 12 percent recovery um guam has a good track record we've got a lot of help folks have come in ironically from the commonwealth of the northern marianas Ironic because usually it's us going up there to help them with storms. So it's wonderful to have them send some crews down to help us. Actually, crews from Rhoda, they got hit as well, uh, but they finished their recovery and they sent some bucket trucks and some folks down to help us. Um, people from Washington State came as well. Yeah, let, let the record reflect that Rhoda is a little island north of Guam. Uh, let's see a map uh, and you can tell us where the, the big damage took place. Yeah, so if you take a look at the map, most of the damage uh, was in the northern and the eastern section of the island. So if you look at Jigo, uh, Anderson Air Force Base is right up at the northern tip of the island. Um, and then over to the right side, a little bit down is Mangilao. They've got badly hit um, and Dededo. But pretty much, I mean, the island is only 30 miles long. So you have a storm that's a couple hundred miles wide and it glanced the northern tip of Guam. Um, they couldn't specifically locate the eye because the eye was collapsing and reforming at the time that it sort of went across Guam, but the storm was only moving at like seven miles an hour. So it was actually very slow. So part of the um, intensity of the damage was caused because the storm was very slow moving across uh, the region. So, so there was that uh, problem as well. Your witness, Chris. I was going to say, uh, you mentioned Puerto Rico and Hurricane Maria. One of the conversations that has happens across the Pacific and uh, especially with Puerto Rico and Guam uh, as U.S. territories is this question of the Jones Act and what could be done with the Jones Act so Puerto Rico and Guam are not as um, hard hit uh, in terms of getting supply chains reestablished um, all down the supply chain? You know, in general, the Jones Act, the Buy America Act, a lot of the federal procurement regulations um, sometimes tend to be a hindrance at very critical juncture. So one of the things that Guam is going to need in order to recover quickly and to repair um, we need heavy steel. We need, um, you know, a, a lot of the construction materials and supplies, which we have none of on the island, to be able to recover. Uh, we're building a brand new power plant up north, um, and they had just uh, finished putting the sides up to a major fuel tank that was going to supply that uh, power plant, and it was going to be using a much more energy efficient fuel, which was going to be great for the island. It was going to reduce costs and everything else. The storm severely damaged the tank, and that's going to set the whole project back at least a year. But the problem is all of these policies that then require that all the replacement parts, like for example, the gantry cranes in Guam, you know, they're trying to do repairs, they're trying to fix the wharves down there. And every time we get a budget from the federal government to fix them, um, when you've got all the Jones Act, all the Buy America, all of these federal regulations, which apply great in CONUS locations and don't apply very well in Hawaii, and are even more ridiculous when you get all the way out to Guam, which basically lies within Asia, um, the costs double in, in many cases. And so our ability to economically recover requires that we need help 
getting rid of regulations that make everything unnecessarily expensive. Um, you know, food supplies, water supplies. It's just really difficult. There, there's, you know, one carrier, uh, one main carrier that brings people and cargo out. Uh, United Airlines, uh, I think in Hawaii, everybody might have seen the, the news piece that they did where uh, United claims that it was an accident, uh, but they were trying to charge people uh, up to $8,500 one-way economy to get from Hawaii back to their families in Guam. Um, you know, we immediately our attorney general got on that, was accusing them of price gouging, and they, you know, corrected that. And they said, oh, it was a glitch. We didn't mean it. We're really sorry. But it, it's things like that. So, so the Jones Act is something that it, it's something that protects shipping throughout the United States. We don't expect it to get removed or anything. But for Guam, the need for an exemption, I mean, for that matter, Alaska and Hawaii as well and the CNMI, but for Guam right now, targeted exemptions that would allow us to do that are really important. And for that matter, the H-2 visas in order to be able to get the labor workforce uh, to rebuild. Our hotels were damaged, uh, which is going to hurt our tourism. The military buildup was set back. They need all of those repaired. And residential damage is always the last one. And I feel bad for people that need their homes repaired because the few construction capability uh, companies that are out here are all going to be focused on the military bases and on the commercial side because that's where the money and the draw is. And unfortunately, that's going to potentially leave residences behind because they'll be last in line in terms of getting supplies, which will be too expensive and getting people out here to fix their homes. About 600 homes so far, um, we estimate were lost, which is a lower number, it's manageable. Uh, the CVs are out. I believe they're gonna be announcing some new proposal to, to put roofs on some of these cement homes who had uh, tin roofs. So that's gonna be helpful. Uh, but if we didn't have to deal with the higher costs because of the Jones Act uh, and because of, of Buy America in targeted exempt ways, um, then the, the bit of money that we're getting from the federal government would go so much farther. Um, thank you for that, Ginger. Uh, there was another element that was sort of shadowing the story or maybe overshadowing all of these great issues that you've mentioned, uh, which was cyber attacks from China and I think Typhoon Folds. And there was a lot of buzz about that, which is not unimportant, but how would you contextualize that news with um, the combination of climate change and climate resiliency and climate security even for that matter? So all of those are intertwined, right? So Guam is going through this process where they're putting in a new missile defense system, a 360 degree persistent defense. That defense doesn't work if a typhoon comes through and knocks out the system, the power, the water, and the comms. Um, one of the interesting things that happened this storm is everybody's in, in a different place in 20 years. We're all using social media. We're all using um, you know, cell phones. There's three main cell phone companies. Two of them had significant, well, all three had difficulty, two more than the others. Um, and a lot of people were not able to communicate at the height of the storm. Um, literally every single radio station got taken out uh, at one point in the storm. And then slowly one or two were able to come back. They're not all fully back on yet. They're, they're still struggling to get back online. So communication, which is really the lifeblood of everything that goes on. So as the Chinese are looking at this, they're taking advantage potentially to see how resilient, this is a stress test, the ultimate stress test, because if they hit us with a cyber attack, and we've been experiencing this um, obviously for months, they hit the hospital. So the hospital actually had uh, you know, multiple attacks. There was some discussion about how they did get in um, and you know, they had to protect the records and the, the recovery was slow. That, that was another issue the hospital was going through where nurses were having to literally hand write information on patients and walk it around because the computer system was down for over a month. Um, and that was a hack. The power authority I spoke to the director and he said that they constantly uh, are getting attacks from uh, cyber, which we believe are affiliated with the Chinese government. So it, it all sort of works together to show that there is a potential vulnerability that needs to be shored up and it needs to be shored up fast. The comms needs to be protected. The underwater cables need to be protected, um, especially when you've got Chinese trawlers that are a couple hundred miles off of Guam circling and we've got so many uh, trans-Pacific cables that you know terminate in Guam and, and go through to Asia. 
um, you know, we're vulnerable. So far, we've been able to stave it off. Uh, the federal government has a lot of resources that they put to help uh, the power authority. Ironically, I was talking to the former head of the power authority, and he said, you know, some of the systems on Guam are still old and manual. And we all kind of laughed. And we said that kind of makes it invulnerable to a cyber attack because they're not even online yet. They're, they're still the old fashioned <laughs> crank way, right? Um, which might be a good thing, but that's not going to last for long. I mean, it, right now, the, the technology embedded uh, in the power authority, they know everybody who has power and who doesn't. So as technology increases, the vulnerability increases. And it's something that, you know, not only the, the citizens of Guam have to look at, but also the military and the federal government, because Guam is a strategic part of that whole network. And th the fact that it's been clear that they've been trying to hack into our systems um, is something that's very concerning and that needs to be made a top priority. You know, this, uh, this raises a remark I wanted to make uh, for your reaction, Ginger. You know, Guam is our biggest military base to the West. And uh, it's, it's very important. It's not, you know, it's not clear uh, unless you're uh, at high levels of the Department of Defense exactly what Guam's future is in terms of uh, its, its military and strategical position. But, it's, but the likelihood is that it's an important strategical position. I'm sure you're familiar with that. And the question is, um, so, okay, you were pretty well prepared. And your response was pretty good, with some exceptions. But it strikes me that if Guam is a, the, the largest Western base we have, if Guam is strategically important to uh, Indo-Asia Pacific, which I, you know, it seems clear that it is, then Guam ought to be more resilient. It ought to be hardened more. And we have more climate change coming down. Obviously, Guam is in the path of these extreme storms. Um, so we ought to go not to 100%, but to 150% in order to protect our investment uh, in this in strategic investment in this part of the world. Your thoughts? I, I, absolutely. I mean, you nailed exactly what the issue is. People talk about when push comes to shove, it's about the deterrent capability. When push comes to shove, we have bases in Japan, in Okinawa. We have bases in South Korea. We have uh, the EDCA agreements in the Philippines. When push comes to shove, if there ever does come a time where the United States needs to demonstrate that it has forward presence, those foreign countries have their own domestic considerations that very likely would make them highly reluctant to get involved. I mean, just look in Iraq, uh, when the United States was going to uh, go into Iraq and Turkey at the last minute said, no, you can't use our airspace, even though we were friendly with Turkey. That could actually happen. In the case of Guam, it is an unincorporated territory of the United States. For better or worse, we have no say. The United States has an absolutely 1,000% solid capability to use that island for everything it needs, and it is within striking distance. Hawaii is too far away. You know, Alaska, Kona is just too far away. Guam is really what we've got, and the CNMI. So that was why I was making that, that aircraft carrier analogy. Uh, the military, I think, has a responsibility to itself to ensure that the climate resiliency question is taken care of, because that vulnerability, why are you spending billions of dollars putting up a missile defense system and not making sure that the air, air base and the naval base and the people on Guam have basics like communication, power, and water. I mean, that will take you out, right? You just go back to Sun Tzu. <laughs> the, the military and logistics, we're, we're all talking about pre-positioning fuel and pre-positioning parts for submarines. Well, if we don't even have a dock that can survive a storm, if we don't have power and water for, for the people that are doing, I mean, they had to bring in the, the Nimitz and they were using that to broadcast a signal so they could communicate with the military families and staff that were in housing that at, at one point, some didn't have power and some didn't have water. Um, so absolutely, I, I think that the investment must be ratcheted up. There's good news. I believe there are some um, congressional affairs folks from DOD that'll be coming out to Guam hopefully soon. Um, and, and it really needs to be raised as a defense issue for the entire United States. Um, and it's really a drop in the bucket. Guam is very small. It would not take a lot to harden us. 
Fantastic. I, I don't have any further questions except what can we do next for the civilian population in the coming weeks and months um, in terms of this uh, issue of resiliency? I, I think the, the structural pieces are what really need help. Uh, Guam needs help. Guam needs um, advocates in Congress to help us get exemptions so that things like, you know, assistance for long-term fixes are in place. In the short term, I, I believe FEMA's on the ground doing what they can. We've got almost 15,000 people that applied. Uh, they're helping, they've already handed out $2.5 million in assistance to families. There's shelters for families to stay at until they can get their homes back in order. I mean, the day-to-day -day needs are being met and all the folks that need to be here are here. Um, and are coming in, and it'll be tough for people for another two or three weeks. Uh, but you know, Guam is tough, and and we'll make it through. Um, and, and then, of course, you know, we need to look and see how we can perform better each time um, and, and improve. But from an external standpoint, what we need is advocacy. Um, and interest, not just in the short term. Guam is not Puerto Rico, um, and, and I don't mean to say anything bad about Puerto Rico, but I will say that we've been through storms, and every single time we've been through a storm, we always come out stronger. Every single time those storms take out homes that are not concrete, uh, a greater proportion of them come back concrete or add steel shutters, and the FEMA assistance helps that happen. So Guam itself always gets stronger and always comes back. But that the question of the long-term resiliency and bringing down some of those policy barriers so that the economic recovery of Guam, you know, I'm worried about tourism. We need to be able to get that back. COVID was a huge blow. It literally wiped out our tourism like it did Hawaii's. We were just getting back to 65% of our tourist uh, numbers. Uh, and then the storm hit and, and, you know, we're back at ground zero again. So, we need the strategic help that will enable our economy to get back on its feet and that will harden the infrastructure and the services so that Guam can flourish. Because if the people of Guam flourish, then it's better for the military, it's better for everyone, it's better for the security of the entire Asia Pacific region. Chris, do you, you. you want to thank Ginger for her contribution to this conversation? Bye. And your insight and the text messages these last few weeks, and uh, we'll we'll talk we'll talk more and continue the conversation at the higher levels as much as possible in press. Christopher Jay, thank you so much for the opportunity, and we're so grateful that you've thought of Guam, and we hope that you keep the people in in your prayers. Uh, we're resilient, but we we know that people are thinking of us, and that really it's very helpful. So thank you so much. Hopefully, they'll think more now. Uh, Ginger Cruz, uh, Christopher Cottrell. Thank you so much. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.